poison ivy research finding. All right, good afternoon. So today I'm going to be talking about some new insights that we have into the urethials of uh, poison ivy. So poison ivy, or toxic dendrin radicans, is a native dioecious weed that produces the metabolite urethial, which is represented generally here. Uh, it is a catechol, so it has two orthohydroxyls. And this R group is a carbon chain that can differ in length between 15 carbons or 17 carbons. And this is the chemical that uh, gives you the rash that is so associated with poison ivy and other members of the toxic convention genus. Poison ivy is found across the eastern United States. However, along with global change, it is presumed to become more prolific and also more impactful, leading to the idea that it might be to be able to be considered a native invader. Some of the ways it's going to change along with uh, climate change is going to uh, increase in biomass along with higher ambient carbon dioxide levels. Many plants do that. Um, it's adapted to human-caused disturbance. So it's become more prolific in that way. However, the most concerning is that it's also going to produce more allergenic forms of tree shells. So this graph is showing you on the right, under elevated carbon dioxide levels, uh, you find a higher amount of the most allergenic forms of urethials. Uh, so that really behooves us to understand more about this plant in general, and especially about urethials that it produces. We know a few things about the urethials in general. So urethial is a contact allergen, not a poison, as the name poison ivy might suggest. Um, urethial is a collection of C15, so the length of the carbon chain here is 15 carbons, and C17 congeners. And as I mentioned, it has different forms, and what I mean by that is different degrees of unsaturation within this carbon chain. And the more allergenic forms are the ones that have more double bonds within that carbon chain. Urethial is found in all members of the toxic dendrin genus. So this is a picture of the Japanese lacquer tree um, that is actually scored and the sap collected to use urethial from in artisanal lacquerware production. When urethial uh, rise, it essentially polymerizes into this shiny black coating that can be really useful for a number of practices. Um, one important thing to note is while the ratios in general are found within all members of the toxic condition genus, the ratio of the C15 and C17 species changes depending on the species. So in poison ivy, uh, work was shown that C15 urethials were higher than the C17s, but that's not necessarily the case with other members. However, there's a lot that we don't know about urethial, and first and foremost is what function is it performing for the plant? We can make a lot of educated guesses. Uh, it could be a wounding response because it is constitutively produced, and when it gets exposed to air, it can create this hard uh, coating and prevent uh, uh, possible further damage. Maybe it's a specific deterrent to herbivory. This is a picture of a poison ivy leaf where a uh, insect has chewed on the leaf, it hit a vein, and then some urethra shell poured out and polymerized onto the leaf's surface. But really, it's speculation. As far as we know, we're the only species that has an allergenic reaction to the chemical, and it's highly unlikely that it evolved just to affect us. Some other things that we don't really know uh, is where in a leaf does it accumulate? So pictures like this would tend to suggest that, okay, yes, it's in the leaves or in the veins. However, we haven't done, there hasn't been any work done to actually localize it on a specific tissue and tissue basis. The closest that we have done with that is looking at where 
C15 and C17 urethiols localized within the stems of poison ivy seedlings. And you can see that they seem to be uh, in a couple of different areas here and may be localized to some structures that we presume to be resin ducts. However, this is the only work that's been done um, with looking at where does urethiol accumulate in specific tissues. And something else we don't really know is uh, how much variation is present within this trait? So do we see uh, across individuals that uh, total urethral amounts are different in different individuals? Or does that ratio of C15 to C17 urethrals change? And um, is this trait really plastic? Or does it seem to be sort of congregate to some uh, normal value within the population? Um, the first question I'm very much interested in, the function, but that is a topic for another time. Uh, I'm going to be mostly focusing on some preliminary survey type work that I did that helps to get some insights into uh, these last two questions. And the first was a really simple idea of where specifically in the leaf does Yurisha accumulate? Some work that had been done in the past would suggest that, in general, stems, berries, and bark accumulate more urethiols than leaves, but nobody had done anything like this where they dissect leaves into discrete sections of the petiole, veins, and the intervenal leaf tissues, and then analyze those sections specifically for urethial accumulation. And to, to measure urethial accumulation, uh, we did that through GCMS. Looking at the results here, um, it is consistent with some of the previous work that had been done. Woodier, vascular type tissues like the petiole and the veins tend to accumulate more urethrals than the intervenal leaf tissues. And the whole leaf is, as you would expect, somewhere in a mix between all three of those. However, as I was doing some of this work, um, I was looking at some of my raw data and just noticed some interesting trends within that. So this is um, the same graph where total urethiolis is the y-axis and the tissue type on the x, but for just one of the accessions. I did five accessions in total. This is just showing the data for one of them. And you can see that C15 urethiolis are much higher than the C17 ratios. Okay, that was all well and good. That's what we expected. That's what previous reports in the literature had said as well. But that wasn't the case for all of my accessions that I was looking at. And some of them, the C17s were much higher than the C15 ratios. And that was completely unexpected. Um, all of the reports that had been done in the literature before, everything that we had done in the lab, uh, we mostly worked on seedlings, but all of those had shown that C15 initials were higher than C17, so this was really unexpected. Um, and it got even a little bit crazier when we noticed that it was broken down by sex. And this was only a handful of plants for my view. It was only five plants, but it was very clear. The male plants, there were three of those, and all three of them showed that pattern, but the females, the C15s, were higher. So, I got really excited about that. Um, I thought that was really kind of crazy, and I needed to get some more data to see if this trend was real. Uh, was it really the case that there was some sort of sexual dimorphism in this plant um, that was explaining the ratio of C15 to C17 ratios, and where previous reports in the literature just biased for choosing only female plants? So I took a little bit of a, a detour and went down that path and started to try and answer this question. Are urethral sex specific? So to do this, I chose 10 male plants and 10 female plants. And to um, sex poison ivy, it was necessary to uh, look at the flowers of the plants. Um, you can see that there are some just visually very distinct differences in these two pictures of flowers. So 
the males here, uh, the flowers are overall a little bit smaller in diameter, but they are much more clustered. There's many more of them on a given panicle. Um, the color is slightly different than the females. And of course, the female flowers are the only ones that are going to develop into fruits and then seeds. So you can be very sure that um, for a lot of these female plants, we've been collecting seeds from the previous year, so we knew the sex differences very well. And of course, they are a dioecist species, so if you look at the actual sh the, uh, sexual organs of the flowers, you can tell them apart from some of that as well. Um, one other thing that I did while I was collecting from these plants, so uh, I sexed them by using the flowers, but I collected leaf tissues from these plants to do this Yuri Shial specific analysis. Uh, one thing I did is I went back to those plants a couple months later and collected a second set of leaves to see if Yuri Shial accumulation or the ratio of C15 to C17 Yuri Shials tended to change over the course of a growing season. Looking first at total C15 and C17 Yuri Shials, uh, this relationship was not explained by sex or the collection time. So uh, for males and females, they were fairly similar. Um, and for the early and late time points, it didn't seem that the total Eurytiols were changing very much over the course of those two months <coughs> in the leaf tissue, remember. But I was interested mostly in the ratio. So what did that look like? Well, they weren't actually that different. So unfortunately, um, when looking at the larger data set, 10 males and 10 females, um, there wasn't a significant difference between male plants and female plants. Nor did this ratio of C15 to C17 ratio change over the course of the growing season. So that still suggests a couple of things that can be interpreted from these negative results. The first is that, yes, C15 degree shawls, you can see this is the ratio here, so anything higher than one suggests that, or is that uh, uh, C15 degree shawls are higher than C17 degree shawls. And, and at, on average, yeah, all of the, the plants do have higher C15 than C17 degree shawls. Um, it also suggests that those handful of male plants that I had earlier on were just strange individuals. So it is a, the ratio of C15 to C17s is on an individual to individual basis, not necessarily tied to sex, and we just happen to have a slight sampling bias when you're looking at it before. That variation in this trait uh, could be due to plasticity, um, it could be that those plants have some sort of uh, uh, environmental cue, perhaps, that drives the production of C17s to be higher than C15s. Or it could just be the genotype of the individual. To parse that out, we would need to do some more studies. Um, but at any rate, it was still interesting that um, we found any individuals that had higher C17s than C15 degree shawls. Um, to me, I, without really understanding what the function is of your shells in general, and with how similar these two uh, species of your shells are, it's really difficult to make any inferences as to why you see differences in C17s accumulating higher than C15s. But um, it definitely opened the door to um, the possibility that there is some functional difference between them. But I'm stubborn and I didn't want to quite give up on that idea of these being sex specific. So I had the idea that, all right, well, this, that's true for the leaves, but what about in sexually specific tissues? This is a dioecious species. I was already collecting the flowers from a subsampling of my 10 males and 10 female plants to look at, to survey the volatiles that they were producing. Um, but as part of that, I'll sort of 
come back to this point. Um, I had also assessed Eurytiaols in these flowers as well. Um, and these flowers were collected at the same time as the early time point from the same plants as the early time point for this subsample of four males and four female flowers. And here we see something a little bit different. Um, again, sex wasn't a strong predictor in the ratio here, uh, and neither was tissue type, but the interaction was really important. Um, female flowers specifically have much more C15 urethiols than C17 urethiols. Um, this ratio difference here of over 10, that's the same sort of ratio that we see in seedlings all the time. We always see that the C15 urethiols are about 10 times higher than the C17 urethiols. Um, I think this would be, again, this was just sort of an afterthought because I didn't want to quite give up on this idea of looking at it. Um, so it, it needs to be looked at again to make sure we're not having the same issues of sampling bias. Um, but I'd be very much interested to see um, tracking this. So see about flowers when they first develop. All right, they have much higher C15 degree shells. All right, track the developing fruits. And an undergraduate in our lab, Nylot, is doing exactly that, looking at degree shells over the time course of when the fruits first develop to when they uh, desiccate as uh, seed, and then carry that through to uh, germinating seedlings from that same collection to see if this trend of C15 reshells being 10 times higher is true for that entire uh, growth of a developing progeny. Um, that would suggest that there is a strong reason as to why the C15 degree shell, some function perhaps that they are performing that is really beneficial in the early time point of the development of the species. As I said, um, I did want to survey the volatiles originally uh, when I was collecting these, um, uh, these flowers and to show you guys some of this survey data as well. Um, this is just looking at the male flowers first. Um, in total, we saw about eight primary compounds that made up like 83% of everything we are extracting off of the uh, GCMS that we were doing for this analysis. Um, everything else was, there were many more other compounds, but they were all very low in abundance. And some of the things we saw, uh, we saw some classic stuff that you see in all types of plant material and caryophyllene. But we also saw some terpenoids, uh, specifically pharmacines, that were in high abundance in these flowers. And pharmacines have been um, linked to being attractants for beetle pollinators. So uh, these could be uh, specific to trying to attract pollinators. Looking at or comparing to female flowers, uh, they were overall pretty similar. Um, the main difference between the male and the female flowers were that the female flowers had more going on. They had more compounds, but they were all very low in abundance. Comparing to leaves is where you see the big differences. Um, a lot of things stayed similar, but specifically the pharmacines were absent within the leaves. They were specific to flowers. So that also might suggest that these were trying to attract pollinators to the flowers. Now I mentioned that I extracted urethial from these flowers as part of doing this volatile analysis. And the reason behind that is a question that gets asked or a statement that gets made to me quite often when I'm talking to people about my research on poison ivy. People that are very allergic to it and very afraid of poison ivy will often tell me, oh, if I even get close to the plant, if I get within you know, five feet, then I'll get a rash, even if I don't touch it. Well, the only way that that would be possible is if Eurytia was somehow volatile and was able to move through the air and get onto their skin to create this rash. And I can tell you that 
from what we've done, no, it's not volatile. Uh, we didn't see it, any of these spectra. Um, we even did a purified extract of Uriciol and didn't see it there. We heat that extract up to 80 degrees C, so a hotter day than you can even imagine, and didn't see it there either. Um, the important caveat with that is, you know, you can look but don't touch poison ivy and don't burn it. If you do burn it, then you still, then you will volatilize it and it will get on you too from that. But you can be safe in knowing that you can at least get close without having to worry. So in summary, I this is really turned into a a line of uh, various things that were interesting and easy to try that wound up giving us a lot of new insights and a lot of new directions that we can go um, with studying the urethrials of the toxic potential genus. Um, the first is that uh, completely unexpectedly, we saw some individuals with C17 urethrials in much greater abundance than the C15s, which has not been reported before um, and perhaps suggests some different function that they used to have performed. Consistent with some of the things that we'd seen before, urethrials tend to accumulate within the leaves in the vascular <coughs> tissue. That's very similar to what we uh, think we're seeing in <coughs> the stems of young seedlings. This is more preliminary, but there seems to be some sort of bias for C15 urethrials in the female flowers, and as I mentioned, it'd be very interesting to track that relationship as we know the C15s are also much higher in seedlings as well. And lastly, urethrials are not volatile. I like to thank a couple of people, uh, of course my uh, advisors, John Telesco and Jacob Barney, and the rest of my advisory committee um, collaborators. I especially want to thank uh, Jason Lancaster, uh, who was a, a former student of the, uh, or graduated from uh, Dr. Toll's lab, uh, and he did all the analysis for that volatiles work um, that I just showed you. I was sort of um, his main sort of collector on that uh, front of things. Um, I want to thank uh, Becky Fletcher for helping me out with some of my various stats questions that I had for some of this work. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. You showed C15, C17, uh, red and uh, green, right? Mm -hmm. How you do that? How can you tell? Can you tell them? Per oh, I, I misunderstood it. Yes. Go back to it. Very early. Yeah. All right. So this is a technique called MALDI imaging. Um, yeah. Uh, so this can localize on a very small scale where individual compounds are in a section. Um, so. This can show you that in the green here, where the, where the C17s were localized, and the red as the C15 urethrials. And um, one important thing to note here, uh, that I didn't really go into, not terribly relevant for this conversation, but um, these also should mix in color for how they're being represented. So if they were in the same location, you should see it represented as yellow. But you don't really see too much of that. It seems that the C15 and the C17 degree shells are very much in different uh, tissue types or at least accumulating in different areas within um, this image. Is there any possibility that these compounds are found in the pollen? Oh, in the pollen of the plant. You know, uh, we haven't done anything too much into that sort of finite scale. Um, what I can say is we've, every tissue that we've looked at has had it so far in different amounts, but everything has had it. Um, it would be really interesting to look at uh, the pollen for it as well. I'm um, just thinking because of people who you say that yeah. they're close to doing the pollen that is. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing about this species is 
this, the picture of the flowers here doesn't really give you a good scale outside of this sort of bee that's right there. Um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't produce much pollen. Uh, it would, you know, you can think of like a tree or something like that where it sort of gets stuck onto your car. Um, I don't think it's producing that much. And something else to note is um, it takes a long time for these plants to reach sexual maturity. We don't know for sure how long, um, but I have some plants that have been growing out in the field for three years now, or were growing out in the field for three years, and uh, I guess another decade before they were big enough to become sexually mature. So, yeah, that is interesting though. It'd be cool to look at on a finer scale, like, all right, well, which specific parts are its found?